Chair of Wisdom time. Kristen from Patreon writes, great show. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, what was the status of the Russian Navy in the Baltic? And were there any significant clashes between Russian and German naval forces? Um, okay. The defeat of Russia in the Russo-Japanese War severely weakened the Russian Baltic and Siberian fleet. Now, the rebuilding process gave Russia the opportunity, well, one, to learn from their, their mistakes, to learn from that experience, and revise their military doctrines, but it also gave them, of course, the chance to build new and modern warships. The shipyards of St. Petersburg and Riga, who were overseen by uh, great mil maritime scientists like Alexei Krylov or Ivan Bubnov, mostly concentrated their efforts on producing modern torpedo vessels like the torpedo destroyer Novik class battle cruisers and light flexible torpedo boat squadrons, which is pretty cool. Uh, the Russian fleet was actually on its way to becoming maybe the second most powerful navy on the continent, but the outbreak of the war interrupted that process. Uh, in 1914, when the war broke out, many projects were still in their infancy, and Russia lacked in submarines and dreadnoughts. And a reason why Russia had to play it safe and wait for the support of British submarines was just that. Uh, major sea battles between Germany and Russia, as you asked, uh, were rare. We mentioned the Battle of the Gulf of Riga in our regular episodes, where the German Navy unsuccessfully shelled the Russian battleships that were anchored there. Uh, another would be the Battle of Gotland off the Swedish coast, where Russian cruisers intercepted a German mine laying operation. The biggest sea battle was probably the Battle of Moon Sound in October 1917, um, which was against the Russian Republic, funnily enough, where the Germans outnumbered the Russian fleet and destroyed the pre-dreadnought class Slava. That was a long answer. Uh, Ian JB asks from Reddit, <clears throat> were the Germans the only power to use submarine warfare in order to disrupt supply lines, or did other powers use them for the same purpose? Well, nearly all of the warring nations had submarines in their navies at the time. Um, Germany became most famous for this due to realizing the value, the true value of submarine warfare and their enormous success rate in disrupting the British sea trade lines. Um, since the German Navy wasn't really quite strong enough for just a straight up heads-on fight against the British Royal Navy, they relied on their U-boats to, well, at least harass their enemies at sea. Uh, Germany built 360 submarines and sank around 10, 11 million tons of Allied shipping during the war. That's a lot. But that doesn't mean that other nations didn't use submarines or use them effectively as well. Uh, the French had the Emeraude class, which consisted of six submarines that were mostly used in the Gallipoli campaign, the eight or nine months of that. Um, the Turquois, one of them, was damaged by Ottoman gunfire, while the Safir was supposed to be sunk by its captain to prevent it from falling in the hands of the Ottoman enemies. Um, Austria-Hungary, well, they used the, it was outdated, but it was still useful, the U-20 class, which were sent on patrols in the Adriatic Sea, where they would encounter the Italian Nautilus class. Uh, the Italian, uh, I'm not certain how you pronounce it, it's like Neraid or Neraid, somebody can write in and tell me. But anyhow, that sub and the Austrian SMU-5 clashed underwater, and only one would surface again, and the other would sink with all hands to the cold bottom of the sea, a watery grave. Now, both shot torpedoes at each other, but only the U-5 hit its target. The Ottoman Empire only built one submarine, but scrapped it before the war. Oh, but back to the turquoise, the French one. Um, the Ottomans did actually capture it, and they thought about using it, but they didn't. Uh, Russia had several submarine classes, but they didn't really get the hang of it, and uh, many of them, though that they were technically able for combat, they had significant shortcomings, and most of the Russian submarines were used as mine layers. Uh, the more successful of their submarines were part of the Morge class that operated in the Black Sea and raided some of the Turkish merchant shipping. The most innovative experiments came from the British, and they had attack submarines of their own uh, that would often accompany the Russian fleet. Uh, they even really perfected the art of fighting 
submarines with submarines. Um, the British invented what they called the R class of submarine, which was designed with a huge battery and six torpedo tubes to fight against the German submarines. They also introduced sonar and ASDIC equipment. Now that was a bit too late to have a big impact in the war, but of course it was a big stepping stone to what would happen in the future of naval warfare. From Instagram, D History Guy writes, D History Guy, get it? Huh? D History Guy writes, hey, I've got a question for Out of the Trenches. Did anyone use small mortars during the First World War? Since the Germans and the Japanese both use small mortars like the Granatwerfer 36 or the Japanese knee mortar during the Second World War. Um, I could imagine these types of mortars or grenade launchers to be very useful for a small raiding party. Okay. Well, yes, of course they did. The Granatwerfer 36 was a small field mortar intended to fire grenades over a greater distance than you could throw them and to be more precise than rifle grenades and to take out smaller pockets of resistance. Though deployed in 1936, as the name suggests, the principle uh, to fire bombs and grenades in a wide arc instead of in a straight line was already old as the Great War began, but trench warfare revived the craft of howitzers and mortars. A typical field gun was pretty useless against dug-in fortifications on even ground. And the big grenades of the howitzers were usually too imprecise to hit like a narrow trench effectively, which you'll see in, in the Battle of the Somme, for example. Uh, the technical answer to those problems were small trench mortars. The trench mortars sometimes were nothing more than a short tube, and it was able to fire small grenades at a high angle out of the relative safety of your own trench over, trench, over no man's land and into the foxholes and trenches of the enemy. Um, the Germans were the first to convert their big Meinenwerfer batteries into smaller versions of 7.58 centimeter mortars, 758s, right? Uh, that could be operated by small teams and in narrow places. Now, they produced over 12,000 of them uh, before 1918. The British were quick to build something similar, and they came up with the Stokes mortar. And in principle, it was nothing more than like, okay, it's really simple. It was a smooth bore metal tube mounted on a bipod, right? At two legs. Uh, the grenades had built in self-propelling charge and impact sensitive attachments at the bottom that would catapult the bomb out of the mortar tube. The biggest problem was that they were fairly inaccurate, but they were cheap. Um, they were light enough to transport into an attack, you know, if you were on the run, and you could use them pretty much anywhere on the battlefield. Um, in the Great War, uh, rival trenches, the opposite trenches, would constantly harass each other with small bombs and grenade throwing, um, things that the Germans and the Japanese later went on to create, you know, the superior versions of field mortars was due to their offensive tactics and offensive doctrines. Uh, their weight made them perfect for attacking platoons to carry into the battles of World War II, as you know, since you answer, asked the question. Actually, uh, speaking of mortars, Flo, our social guy, Flo, say hi. Hi. Flo's great-grandfather was actually in a German mortar squad in the Wehrmacht in World War II. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about navies of the First World War, we did a special that you can click right here to see. Uh, don't forget to follow us, follow us, follow us on Instagram and Facebook for all of your dreams to come true. See you next time.